It's my great pleasure and honor to be here with Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, leading writer, thinker, speaker uh, internationally, uh, most well known for his books on Jewish wisdom, Jewish literacy, um, ethical speech, um, book on Hillel, most uh, recently his book on the Rebbe, uh, called Rebbe, uh, New York Times bestseller. So maybe we can start here. Thank you for this time. Thank you, Shmuley. It's good to see you, having known you from the beginning of your career. And very nice things have been happening with you. Thank you. Maybe we can begin here. I mean, you could have taken on any next project. Why did you choose to dedicate over 600 pages to, to the Rebbe? Well, even more so, it was five years. Uh, oh, wow. What happened was, I had always had an, uh, an awareness of Chabad. My father, Shlomo Tulishmalav Shalom, had been the accountant for the Rebbe, mm -hmm. and even from before, the, uh, from the beginnings of the movement in America, his father-in-law as well. But what had happened was, I was asked uh, to do an assessment of his, which I wrote like a column, published it in the forward, on the 12th anniversary of the Rebbe's death. And in writing it, I came to realize just how unusual a figure he was. Because we normally take it for granted that when a charismatic figure dies, the movement will at best hold on to what it has and more likely will start to sharply decline. Right. Suddenly, though, in the case of the Rebbe, the movement expanded in the aftermath of his death. There are now three times as many shluchim. Hmm. Chabad is now represented with Chabad houses in 49 states, and rumors are it might eventually soon quickly get to 50 states in 80 countries. And so I realized we're dealing with a very unusual sort of figure. I don't think Chabad would particularly like this analogy, but it reminded me in a way of Herzl. You know, Herzl left behind a movement that when he died, in 1904, really grew and grew and eventually culminated in the creation of a Jewish state. That was obviously in the political sphere. In the religious sphere, I realized we're dealing with a very rare figure, the sort of figure who comes along very, very infrequently and has such capacity to affect the future. And so that's what. And then as I started immersing myself in it, I saw the Rebbe had another very interesting trait. Most people, as they lead movements and the movements become bigger, one of the prices that ends up getting paid is they can no longer focus that much on an individual. Okay. And the Rebbe always did stay focused on individuals. As much as Chabad became more of a macro movement, it also was a micro movement. And I think that was the source of so much of his power. And I see the extent to which it affects the movement. One of the things I read about in the book, which was particularly congenial, to my own thinking, was the Rebbe was very committed to the use of optimistic language. Hmm. And, uh, you know, because people often wonder, is a writer affected by a book that he or she is writing? One of the ways in which I was affected is I found out the Rebbe disliked intensely the term deadline. Hmm. You know, which, when you're a writer, is a pretty basic term, and it's used all over. And so... In thinking about it, I, I stopped using deadline, and I came up with the term due date. And look at the difference. You know, deadline epitomizes death, due date epitomizes life. Hmm. And uh, that was just one, you know, characteristic example uh, of the Rebbe on that. Also, he had another very interesting thing, how to disagree without being disagreeable. One of the things I found out about, the Rebbe would often give talks in which he critiqued positions with which he disagreed, but he never would identify by name the person with whom he disagreed. And in doing the research, one of the things I discovered was he was then able to cooperate with people with whom he had had very sharp disagreements. Mm. When we think back of the, when we think now of the bitterness that characterizes the American political scene, such awful things are being said uh, out of both parties. You can't imagine that these people could ever work together. The Rebbe gets a letter from a rabbi who was very irked by a position the Rebbe had taken, and the Rebbe starts his response by saying, remember, there are still 612 areas where we agree. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways in which he did it was he always searched for commonalities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so these were, I was just very struck by it, or his whole way of viewing things. Uh, Jonathan Sachs, who said it was the Rebbe who motivated him to become a rabbi, 
Sachs, who you know subsequently went on to become the chief rabbi of England and really one of the significant Jewish writers of our time, said that when he was about 21 and he met with the Rebbe, in the course of speaking with the Rebbe, he says, I recently found myself in a situation. And the Rebbe said to him, don't use that expression. Say, I placed myself in a situation. Mm -hmm. Because if you can place yourself in one situation, you can place yourself in another situation. Mm -hmm. If you see yourself in passive terms, I found myself in a situation, you're in a sense already mm -hmm. giving up in advance. And uh, and Sachs says that ever since then, he's never used that expression. So what was striking to me was how the Rebbe would impact uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then you find out fascinating things. There is some correspondence between the Rebbe and Ronald Reagan. And, you know, I always assume the letters from Reagan were just very formal letters. Obviously, one of the president's secretaries would write them and, and Reagan would sign it. I was interviewing, and this is terrible, I'm forgetting the name of the man, who was, who was one, Reagan's domestic, one of his domestic policy advisors, who said that Reagan actually would take up the Rebbe's letters to the second floor from the Oval Office and would come back with uh, handwritten things that, <laughs> that he had drafted. So these were all, you know, he turned out to be a, a really unusual figure, a more worldly figure than I would have yeah. imagined. And no, I'll tell you one more story, yeah. because I know that this also ties in with a subject that's yeah. quite interesting to you. Uh, in 1968, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman ever elected to the House of Representatives. And at that time, 68 was only four years after the passage of the Civil Rights Bill, and the House still was controlled in large measure by Southern Democrats, many of whom were racist. And so they started, they decided to appoint Chisholm to the Agriculture Committee, which was obviously intended as a slight. She came from Bed-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights in Brooklyn. Uh, when she was appointed to the Agriculture Committee, one of the New York newspapers headlined it, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. And she was upset. She got a call from the Rebbe's office that the Rebbe would like to see her. He was actually a constituent of her uh, district. And she came to see him, and he said, I understand you're very upset. She had met him before when she was campaigning. And she said, I'm upset, I'm humiliated, I'm furious. And the Rebbe said, God's given you an opportunity. The Agriculture Committee, there were so many hungry people in America. Look what you can do. Find creative ways to feed people. On her first day in Congress, she meets Bob Dole from Kansas, and he was concerned because farmers in Kansas were having problems with oversupply of crops. They work together, and she plays a major role in expanding the food stamp program, and a few years later, a very major role in establishing WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, mm -hmm. in need. The whole story about the Rebbe didn't really come out until the end of her career. After 15 years or 16 years in Congress, when she retired at a retirement breakfast, she told the story of how the Rebbe had inspired her at a very bleak moment. And she then concluded by saying, if poor children today are getting food, it's because that rabbi in Brooklyn had vision. Hmm. So right away, we know we're not dealing with your yeah. average sort of Rebbe, we're dealing yeah. with a more worldly figure. So, so picking up on that last My point. My future question answers will be brief. Yeah, no, no, it's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Is it, to pick up on this point of not dealing with an average person, some have bemoaned that we've lost the era of Gadolim, mm -hmm. the era of, of the real giants, right? And whether it's, you know, outside of the Jewish world, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, Gandhi, um, or in the Jewish world, um, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you graduated from Yeshiva University, so someone like Rabbi Soloveitchik or, or the Rebbe. Um, first of all, do you agree with that, with that assessment? Um, and secondly, do you think it's a problem? You know, I mean, the Rebbe, it's sort of you know, another comparison, a comparison Chabad wouldn't like, was kind of like the Jewish Pope, you know, to the extent mm -hmm. of having such a broad following. And today people say there's not three microphones, there's thousands of microphones. And so it's harder to have such of a layer of impact, uh, like someone the Rebbe like, you know, had at that time. So do you agree that there's sort of a decline of positions of Gedolim, great sort of great monumental leaders in our time? And is that a positive or negative thing? It's a very fascinating question. And, you know, I don't often get asked questions yeah. that I haven't really thought about. Uh -huh. So, yes, I think it's a harder world also in which to achieve that position. Mm -hmm. Because in a sense, too much is known. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. I recall, 
I don't keep journals. So somebody once made a very wise comment. They said, anybody who thinks you can't change history has never tried to write their memoirs. But I do recall my reaction during Watergate in 73, when I was sure that as a result of what was being revealed about the Nixon White House, dishonest people, tricksters would no longer go into politics. Because it seemed everything could get exposed. People just got better at learning how to do it. But in a sense, what has also happened is, I think the intrusive nature of the media Mm -hmm. and of all these things makes it increasingly undesirable for many people to want to go into public Uh life. Uh You know, because America now is so partisan that how many of us want to go into life with people running around asking, do you know any dirt about this person and doing it? So I think it's had, on one level, a discouraging effect. Having said that, you're raising an interesting issue. Are, well, I'll give you an example, because uh, I have thought about this a yeah. little. At the time America was founded, there was an outpouring of some very exceptional people. Washington, Jefferson, Adams. These were, And the whole country's population was under 5 million. So it raises an interesting question. You know, this year, I don't know if we have necessarily the most impressive people running for many offices. And somebody once pointed out to me, maybe during a time of genuine crisis, the sort of people who would not normally want to go into politics will be drawn into it because it's such a crisis going on. Mm -hmm. And maybe at other times, this is viewed as a less desirable area to go into. Mm -hmm. So I think that might tie in with it. Yeah, I don't know, you know, the... Who are the great people? Right. And right. would it be better if there were? Probably. Right. There probably is something nice about heroes. I saw the movie. This is heroism of a different level. Yeah. But I remember I saw the movie Sully, you know, recently about the captain of the... Tom Hanks, right? Yeah. Yeah, where Tom Hanks plays Sullenberger, this extraordinarily quick-thinking, incompetent pilot who landed in the Hudson River and saved all these lives. And I remember when I left it, my wife and I were just in a good mood. It was actually nice to see something about somebody who had really done something heroic. So so, um, sticking on this theme of books, um, you know, I remember actually when I was in college uh, and I was reading Jewish Wisdom and it was transformative for me. Oh, thank you. And and I'm sure you've heard many people who have been transformed by, by books you've written. And I wonder what sort of inspiration do you look for, for, for the books you write? What, what sort of sparks, your interest or your process in terms of what you're going to take on? Okay, first of all, number one, I'm thinking if I have an idea, is there something out there like it? Uh Now, if an idea is utterly original, it's probably not a good idea either. Uh, Louis Finkelstein, who was the long-term chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Mm -hmm. used to tell rabbinical students, if you come up with an idea for a sermon that nobody has ever thought of before, it's probably wrong. <laughs> okay. So with books, right. interestingly, what I found out, sometimes people think, nobody's ever written about this. But nobody wrote about it exactly the way I wanted. Mm-hmm. The first book right. I did when I wrote with my friend Dennis Prager when we were 26 was called Then Eight Questions People Ask About Judaism. Mm-hmm. It became nine. We wanted the basic questions people you know, were addressing and try to get to the heart of it. So number one, I want to think, is there a need for the book? Secondly, is it something... So in other words, is the book about something that if I wasn't the writer, but I saw it had come out, would I want to buy it? Right. And do I think I have something distinctive and original to say? Mm-hmm. So that when I wrote the book Jewish Literacy, which is sort mm-hmm. of a bit of an encyclopedic yeah. overview, my goal was, was to provide basic information that somebody who really didn't know about Judaism could read it and have a context for understanding a right. term. At the same time, I wanted people even who were knowledgeable to find some chut, some chiddush, some insight that could do it. So that when I wrote the book, I imagined myself, if I'm asked, there are 350 short chapters, if I'm asked at a speech, what's the significance of this term in Jewish life? You know, because... I wrote it in an unusual way. I wrote the book out of my head uh, because it's encyclopedic in scope. If I had first started researching it and then writing it, it would have got, encyclopedias are often not very much fun to read. So I figured take what makes this concept memorable to me, that's most likely to make it interesting and memorable Uh to others. uh I then did my research 
uh, because number one, I wanted to make sure I wasn't making mistakes. I don't have an infallible memory. And I want to make sure I didn't leave out something mm -hmm. significant. And obviously there were some entries where I really did have to research because it wasn't. But for most of the entries, I had over years of reading and thinking about these things had evolved, you know, certain thoughts on it. The Revy book was harder to write because I'd never really written a conventional right. biography. Yeah. What, what were some of the books and who were some of the authors that um, inspired your, 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 your original thinking and inspired you as, as an author? Okay, I'll tell you a few people who did. Uh, one book, which is now a very, very well-known book, but when I read it, it was not well-known at all, was Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember I was, I think, a sophomore in high school. There was a little bookstore near my house. I remember I got it as a paperback for 60 cents, which immediately alerts us to the fact that it was a different age. And... Frankel's understanding as a result of his World War II experiences that basically there are good people and not good people, those are the only two races of human beings that matter, was very much akin to how I was coming to understand Judaism. Because a lot of emphasis in Judaism is, uh, when people speak about it, Judaism brought monotheism into the world. But in a certain sense, you could argue that's an arithmetic reduction. What I think Judaism really brought into the world was ethical monotheism. Mm -hmm. The notion that there's one God and that God's primary demand of human beings is ethical behavior. And, you know, that was that was very meaningful to me. But if I look at the other books, so one of the people who, who, who I think did a very great thing, there was a British rabbi, Louis Jacobs. And Jacobs was really quite a scholar, but he had a talent that I admired and which I've tried to emulate, which to be able to take something relatively complex mm -hmm and explain it in a way that makes it accessible. So once again, so that people who are highly scholarly can appreciate what you're saying, and people who don't know can have access to it. And that's really always what I wanted to do, because I've always understood about myself, if I can't explain something well to another person, it means I don't really understand mm -hmm. it myself. Mm -hmm. So I've only tried to do it, you know, with those things, uh, with those things that I did. I must admit, one of the books, which is not considered a great work of literature at all, that deeply impacted me was the novel Exodus. I read it when I think 11 years old, and a lot of history I learned from it. Some of it turned out not to be so accurate, but uh, I remember the emotional impact. And then, of course, I found that I have a friend who's a conservative rabbi in Florida, Leonid Feldman. Leonid was, uh, I think, the first Soviet-born Jew who got ordained at JTS, and he told me the story when he was given the book in Russia. It was like underground. And he met someone on a park bench and he said, 24 hours from now, I have to return it to this park bench. And he said, when he returned it 24 hours later, he had decided uh, to make Aliyah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the book, uh, the book had a profound effect. There's a wonderful book by a British uh, philosopher, Jonathan Glover, called Humanity, A Moral History of the 20th Century. And it is a stunning historical account of the century. And Glover is what I would call sort of a tragic atheist. He doesn't believe in God, but he does acknowledge that without God, without something higher than human beings, basically what we have about morality are just matters of opinion. Mm -hmm. And so that's, uh, that's bothersome to him. By the way, there's also another, this is a much less glorious sort of book, but uh, I've also written a series of murder mysteries. Oh, really? Yes, the fact that you responded as you just did. Oh, really? No idea. That's one of the reasons why I haven't continued writing the murder <laughs> mystery. Or sometimes people will come up to me and say, I read your mystery. I loved it. And I said, well, if more people were like you, I would have written more. I uh, created a character, Rabbi Daniel Winter, uh -huh. who solved, you know, because the truth of the matter is, if you write mysteries, either they're police procedurals, or if they're if they're amateurs who solve it, you're going to have to, in one way or another, base it on yourself. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine who's a rabbi in Israel, Levi Kelman, Levi Wyman Kelman, said to me, he says, you know, Joseph, your, your character, your main character is all of your good points and none of your bad points. <laughs> uh, so I did one. The first was called The Unorthodox Murder of Rabbi Wall. It was about the murder of a woman rabbi. The second was called... Uh, isn't that good? I'm not remembering the title of my own book. <laughs> the Final Analysis of Dr. Stark. I always got in one of the themes I wanted to write about. It's about the murder of a gossiping psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So, And I deal it with the laws of Lashon Ra and an eye for an eye, which deals can revenge. 
ever be justified. And I had read a book called A Kiss Before Dying, which was written by Ira Levin when he was like 24. It's just a brilliantly structured book. So, uh, you know, so there's been a variety. And then there's a wonderful... Do you ever come across a writer, Chaim Maccabee? No. Get a hold of a book okay. by Chaim Maccabee yeah. called Revolution in Judea, okay. uh, which is his understanding of who, of who Jesus was and uh, what had happened. Yeah. And it, it's a stunningly interesting yeah. book. Well, looking back at back at Frankel, I, I, um, you know, this notion that we survive and thrive based upon our search for meaning, um, I, I think that's certainly still true today. And the challenge I find as an educator is to entice people to find their meaning within Jewish wisdom. Um, and it's been very helpful that you've written uh, works that, that do make that more accessible. Thank you. And um, so, and so, um, staying on books for just another moment. What 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 are you working on now? Um, and what do you hope to be working on in the next few years? Okay, yeah. I will tell you a few things. I'm working now on editing a commentary. My friend Dennis Prager, uh, for years, for many years, taught a class in the Chumash, a week by week class, mm-hmm. going through the whole Torah, and uh, a mutual friend of ours. Uh, Joel Alperson arranged to have it all uh, transcribed, and there are 5,000 pages. So I'm editing basically a commentary on the Torah, which is offering me a wonderful opportunity to study Torah every day for a few days. And the goal of the commentary, as Dennis wants it, and as I want working on it as an editor, is how can we apply the Torah in our daily behavior? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, because some co- some commentaries which are very scholarly get academic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What does this tie into in middle in the middle of Syrian mm-hmm. law? You know, and other things like that. And others can get very midrashic. But really, you know, what was it? Yeah. How did the Torah want to affect us? I have a. Uh, should I describe other yeah. projects I want to work? Yeah, on? maybe one. Other, yeah, let's hear one other. Yeah. Okay, I have a book that I want to write one day called "Blinded by Passion." The goal of the book is. That whenever people make something other than ethics their central uh-huh. concern, uh-huh. even if what they want to, even if their central concern is something very valuable, it yeah. messes up their ethics. Uh-huh. So that, for example, Martin mm-hmm. Luther thought that everything depended on faith. If you have faith in Jesus, you will be saved. And now I'm going to quote from him literally: "Even if thousands of times in one day you murder or fornicate." Mm. Murder a thousand times in one day is horrific beyond belief. Fornicate mm-hmm. thousands of times, I don't exactly understand mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, but he actually yeah. said that. And if you don't have faith, you'll be damned. So here you take something that's a ve- wonderful thing, faith, but it can become a detrimental thing. Uh, Immanuel Kant, leading moral philosopher of the last three centuries. Kant, oddly enough, had taken a position. Well, this is not so odd. I mean, what Kant is known for are the categorical imperatives. Right. Kant personally was a believer, but he felt that for an ethical system to work, it couldn't be based on this is what God said. It had to be based on universal principles of rationality, one of which is that you can never lie. We don't want to be lied to. You can never lie to somebody else. But Kant took it to an extreme. So he actually writes Kant that if you see somebody running and somebody chasing after who clearly wants to kill the person and, he, and the other and the pursuer asks you where the first person Hmm. ran, you're forbidden to lie. Hmm. And it struck me, first of all, it struck me as horrible in a number of ways, is the most important moral lesson the German people needed to learn was that you can never lie. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cicela Bach, the philosopher, wrote a book called Lying, in which she said there was no question that according to Kantian ethics, a German who was a German ship captain who was smuggling Jews stopped by Nazis would not be permitted to lie to them. Mm-hmm. And so again, truthfulness is an extremely important thing. But my whenever I find when people have it supersede other things, it has, you know, very bad things. Or take even someone who you mentioned as a moral hero before, Gandhi. Gandhi was probably the second most famous person in the British Empire, the first being Winston Churchill. And I thought, what would happen if we reversed the two? In May of 1940, all of Europe basically was about to fall to the Nazis. In fact, a month later, France did fall. And the only country resisting the Nazis was England. And Gandhi wrote a famous public letter to the soldiers of England, give up your arms and let Hitler occupy England, but don't surrender your souls to them. And I thought, could you imagine if this man had actually had political power? It would have been a catastrophe. So that's, you know, the sort of things that 
So I want to take on their whole bunch. I don't want to. Right. I don't want to depict these people as being bad people because they weren't bad people. Yeah. But I'm saying how an error in ideology can lead yeah. even a good person to do certain things right. that are very right. bad. And I, I think um, that one of the one of the contributions of Jewish ethics is that values are in tension with one another. And there is no one absolute value that rises above the others. That's right. And there's a relativity to each of these values that have to be carefully weighed. And if passivity or nonviolence guides everything, right. right? Or this never, you know, this commitment to truth, you know, guides everything. So I think that'd be a wonderful contribution to write. Yes. Um, so okay. So moving forward, uh, and actually looking at this chumash, how it applies to daily life. Um, we're kind of in a mess in America today. Maybe right. if you're reading this, the mess is over. If you're watching this, the mess is over. But um, looking at the political, uh, looking at the election coming up in I guess, right. about ten, a week and a half, yes. I'm bracketing the, the details of it. But how do you think Jewish wisdom, I mean, I'm sure you can talk about this for hours, but just maybe one thought. How does Jewish wisdom contribute to how one should engage in their civic responsibility, how one should consider voting, consider the role within elections? Yeah, this raises a fascinating issue. I remember in 1972, that was the first election in which I was eligible to vote, the candidates were Richard Nixon and George McGovern. I was not crazy about either of them. I, thought, I felt McGovern had very naive views concerning communism. He had naive views concerning <laughs> Israel. He had a meeting with major donors and supporters of Israel and he was so uninformed about the Jewish community that when one of them said, so what do you think about peace? How do we achieve it in the Middle East? He said, we have to do everything through the United Nations. And one of the very wealthy men who was there said, governor, a, a senator, he said, don't you realize how antagonistic the UN is? So I felt he was a bit foolish. And Nixon, I thought, was a bad guy. I already believed the stuff about Watergate. Mm -hmm. I didn't think he would betray the United States, but I thought he had a, a low character. I ended up, my first election ever, I wrote in Henry Jackson, who was a senator from Washington that I was very, very impressed with. So I don't know, it doesn't normally come, since then that hadn't happened with me, it doesn't normally come to that. Uh, but I was commenting to you earlier in a different context, since by the time we're going to be talking about this, it will be in the aftermath of the election, and I wanted to some extent limit the residue of anger that it will generate. Right. I was uh, mentioning to you a story. Uh, in either 1985 or 86, then President Reagan was invited mm -hmm. to visit an, a, a German cemetery where he thought it was just going to be regular drafted German soldiers. Subsequent to his accepting the invitation, he had found out that it was a cemetery that also had SS officers. And SS officers, in addition to being beyond belief cruel, were also volunteers, so they, they can't even claim they were forced into it. The German, the German president didn't want to let him, excuse me, the German president didn't want to let Reagan off the hook. So Reagan had given an award at the White House to Elie Wiesel. Wiesel publicly asked him not to go. It, it became a whole yeah. issue, and he was getting roundly criticized. Shimon Peres was then the prime minister of Israel. And Paris was up against the wall. What was he going to do? He, he, the, you know, it's one thing yeah. for a Jewish leader here to yeah. attack Reagan. What's going to happen? But what was he going to do? Right. So he didn't. So he said something brilliant. He said, "When a friend makes a mistake, the friend remains a friend. The mistake remains a mistake." Hmm. It'll be very unfortunate if the bitterness that has characterized this campaign will continue and, and just develop, because bitterness like that can drive a society apart. And it ultimately will have to be overcome. Hmm. Things are changing really fast in the world. Yeah. And the 21st century is clearly a paradigm shifts in ways that we understand, and in a lot of ways we don't yet understand. What do you see as sort of the biggest crisis of our time and the biggest opportunity of our time? Mm -hmm. And what do you think Jewish wisdom has to yes, offer right. to those two, to those two fronts? Now, are we speaking in a Jewish sense, or...? Um, I think just, you know, if you want to go there, that's great, but I was thinking sort of globally, you know, as, as part of the human condition of the 21st century. I think the very role that Jews came into the world with is still what the world is in need of, which is ethical monotheism. In the face of, you know, the sort of terrorism that's coming out of the Islamic world, which is not obviously characteristic of all, or even, you know, obviously it's only characteristic of a small percentage of Muslims, 
but a, but a sufficiently significant number that it's wreaking havoc, we see the effects of a monotheism that is not committed mm -hmm. to being an ethical monotheism. Again, I'm not saying this about all Muslims. I'm saying it about... So I think the insistence mm -hmm. that there is a God and that's God's primary demand. Mm -hmm. I am not happy that in the United States, atheism is growing uh, tremendously. It's like the fastest growing, quote, religion right. in the United States. And I don't think that's good. Ultimately, also, by the way, I don't think it's ultimately going to be good for Jews, even though I'm sure Jews large, often being secular help lead it because... Mm -hmm. If the world starts to depose what was the greatest Jewish contribution to the world, it won't th it won't be such a good thing at all. Mm -hmm. So, so I think we got to stand to foot history and continue to argue for the importance of that proposition. We have to safeguard religion from those who don't see ethics as being I I the significant demand of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we've also found is, you see, people who are critical of religion often point out a lot of evils have been committed in the name of religion, which is true. But the main evils that characterized the 20th century were by atheist regimes, mm -hmm. communism and Nazism. Right. And uh, so we, we just can't be just swept up with whatever movement seems to be there at the time. In a sense, it's boring. You know, it's like the famous joke they had that... Uh, in a certain town, there was a man who could never hold down a job. So finally, to find a way to give him a job, they paid him three rubles a week to stay at the mm -hmm. front of the town. And he would be the first person to see when the Messiah came. And he would then announce it to the town. But somebody said to him, but it's a very low salary. He said, yeah, but it's steady work. Mm -hmm. What we really need to have now is steady work right. until right. that messianic time comes. You know, it's almost like as, as uh, D uh, Daniel Hartman recently wrote, uh, mm -hmm. uh, making placing God second. That we need God, but in a sense, and it's kind of a controversial way to put it, that it, God as first, or faith, the monotheism without the ethics first, right, yeah. creates a predicament. Uh, and so how can we not move towards an atheism, of course, but, but, but ensure that a faith does not abstract. You know, a rabbi who I don't uh, care to mention at the moment uh, recently said to me, um, these Islamic fundamentalists uh, are, are correct. God told them, um, to kill these people. But where they're wrong where the, is that God didn't actually say it. I mean, if right. God said it to us, that we should also commit mass atrocities. Right. Right? That's, that's a terrifying view. The notion that faith as command, the akedah, so to speak, uh, should trump our, our ethical consciousness and reason um, and our basic human well, conscience. But, but it's why there's an interesting yeah. distinction. It's one of those, uh, you know, I've worked, uh, I've yeah. helped, uh, Dennis has written about, and I've written with him there about, about the whole story of the Akeda, because it's interesting. Yeah. The story in Western tradition is referred to as the sacrifice of Isaac. Uh -huh. In Jewish tradition, it's called the binding, binding. of Isaac. Yeah. And then we get to the issue, because the punchline of the story is God doesn't want those sacrifices. And ever since, you know, so I, I, I say that because there's always a dilemma. How can we think mm -hmm. of Abraham as being a good guy if right. he was willing to sacrifice his son? Right. And the answer is he could be a good guy still because in those days the full implications of ethical monotheism were not known. Mm -hmm. And God was basically saying mm -hmm. to him, as Abraham understood it, right. are you going to be as devoted and loyal to me as, as idolaters are to their gods? Uh -huh. And so he is. But then God says, I don't want that sacrifice. And once God says it, nobody again ever right. can act yes. in that way. So it's an evolutionary moment. Yeah. Which is actually how Rambam understands Torah, the sense that mm -hmm. things that are commanded or that exist are not eternally good, but they are a part of an evolution of, of an ethical consciousness. Yeah. So actually, I don't want to get too big on, a, too, too, on too big of a tangent. This is, uh, this is you talking, not me. But how could this be the same Abraham who protests, protests God for, for Sodom and Gomorrah? And the way I read that is that he misunderstood the result. He protested God and God was right. So he said, oh, don't protest God. Whereas maybe in this case, too, he should have also protested, but he misunderstood. I want you to know, I've never heard that explanation uh -huh. offered. Uh -huh. That's very smart. Okay. No, no, it's yeah, a shock. Yeah, I, don't know, yeah. I don't know if I'm convinced right. yet, but it's yeah, a okay. very All sharp right. response. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I thought, you know, yeah. maybe it's also that God seemed in the case of Sodom and, and Gomorrah to be... Uh, Opening himself up yeah. to Abraham, yeah. arguing with him, and not in the other. But that's that's very that's very interesting. So uh, our time is short. So let me keep to two questions now. Okay. Um, firstly, um, uh, I don't want to put you in a box, 
but I think of you as a religious and observant Jew. Mm -hmm. um, I also think of you as uh, having a pluralistic orientation. Right. How do you kind of jive these two with being deeply rooted in sort of your Jewish commitments while also holding an ethos of not just tolerance, but of, of some realm of pluralism? Yeah, it's funny. A number of years ago, I was speaking for an organization called uh, the World Presidents Organization. It was the senior division of a an organization called YPO. And they had invited me to speak in, uh, I think it was in Houston. I remember my daughter Shira mm -hmm. was with me at the time. And we were at a dinner, and all the other people at the table were not Jews. And there was one woman who suddenly said to me, but what if you're wrong, Rabbi? I had no idea what she was talking about. and But I could see her husband had a look of dread on his face. She said, what if you're wrong about Jesus? What is going to happen to you? And I remember I had heard her mention earlier something to her husband about their children. So I said, how many children do you have? She said, I have three. She said, do you feel that you need them all to come out the exact same way? And, uh, you know, her husband was like sort of happy somebody was taking her on. Because I think there's something to be said for that. That it, I, I, hmm, I believe, okay, here, I'm going to phrase it yeah, interesting. Yeah, I haven't really, yeah. I wasn't really prepared exactly. Uh, I'm a big believer in capitalism. I'll tell you the sense in which I believe in it. I think Churchill had a very smart comment. He said, the problem with socialism is socialism. The problem with capitalism is capitalists. So I think capitalism, if tethered in by certain restrictions, can do more good. It's, it's more motivational to people. I think where religions have no competition, they tend to be bad news. Mm -hmm. Religious life in the United States evolved in a more tolerant manner because of that. So I don't want there to be only one group in control of it. And I think there are different ways of, of understanding God. I think mm -hmm. the Ten Commandments has to be the unifying feature. Uh, I am obviously an observant Jew, but I've seen that even you'll find, let's say, in the Orthodox world, there's a much greater openness to reaching out to Jews, to not driving people away and to giving people the chance to find Judaism on their own. See, in a sense, it all depends on, there was a mindset that was very common that always focused on what people were not doing. And even, let's say, even in the issues of conversions, does somebody have to accept every law in advance? Mm -hmm. And I always point out, the famous story in Hillel is, Hillel is depicted as converting somebody on the basis of his accepting that principle, which hateful unto you, don't do unto your neighbor, mm -hmm. a commitment to study, and zeal gemar, and now go on studying. So, or you can say, listen, whatever mitzvah somebody's doing is a big deal. So it's sort of the optimistic versus the pessimistic, mm -hmm. and there are trends. My mother told me that when she was growing up in the 1920s and in Manhattan and then in Brooklyn, she was convinced she was going to see the last generation of Orthodox Jews because she knew many people yeah. from Orthodox families who were becoming non-observant. She didn't see anybody non-observant becoming observant. Suddenly we find there's a return. It's an, And in those days, reform tended to be triumphalist. Orthodoxy now sometimes is triumphalist. We're all going to continue to face these challenges. It's going to go back and forth. But if one really believes that, and, and this is one of the things I learned from the Rebbe, who, believe me, yeah. was unbending in his orthodoxy, yeah. but was also unbending in his belief that any mitzvah could be a vehicle for which somebody can grow. And the mitzvah in and of itself was a value. You see, people had always had the feeling, and the Rebbe didn't believe this. This is important to teach. People always had a feeling, oh, yeah, if you become observant, it's meaningful only if you'll become more observant right. or more. Right. And I, there's that famous quote, the Chinese proverb, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Hmm. But what it's really saying is the step is important because it's helping to complete the journey of a thousand hmm. miles. But what he said with his film campaign uh, and the campaign of lighting Shabbos candles, each mitzvah is valuable in and in of itself, itself, even if a person then doesn't move beyond right, it. Right. Because he was actually criticized in certain Orthodox yeah, circles. Right. They said it's absurd. Somebody will put on tefillin, and then they'll go eat an unkosher meal. Right. And he said, yeah, no, it still has a value. But And in that moment, you're not uh, putting tefillin on. You're not the guy who just ate chazer. You're not the guy who picked five minutes ago, right? In that moment, you're the holiest Jew in the world. In the moment right. of the mitzvah, right. it's almost a postmodern uh, notion of uh, of identity. Yeah, you're not you're defined by the moment, really, as opposed to this. 
Um, okay, so uh, a, a last massive question that uh, I'll give you just a, a minute or two. Uh, right. where, where are you pessimistic about the, the Jewish current and the Jewish future? And where do you feel opt- optimistic about sort of where Judaism is headed? Right. I'm optimistic in a sense based on faith. Because, uh-huh. as I said, and yeah. what I said to you that my mother said, you know, yeah. at that time it seemed like people were fleeing Judaism and nobody yeah. would think, and science seemed to triumph everything yeah. and nobody thought it. I'm pessimistic and concerned because of the level of ignorance in the Jewish community, right. which, by the way, is why the work you're doing I consider mm-hmm. so important. It's pluralistic and yeah. focused on Jewish education. Right. Jews can study Torah together. Yes, still very, Yes. And that's a very big thing. Yeah. As long as Jews are studying Torah, I think there's the there's an attraction in it yeah. that can bring them back. Yeah. But it would be hard not to be nervous. Now, again, it's incontrovertible that we're now dealing with very high levels of intermarriage. Right. So the question is, what do we do? Do we have openness to different standards in converting people? Mm-hmm. Uh, how do we treat you know those Jews who have intermarried? There was a time when they were treated more as pariahs. That's no longer the case. Uh, but that is very much going to determine the future of Jewish life in America. But if you want to be pessimistic, I can give you grounds for pessimism. Then I'll have to find something because I don't right. want to end on such a note. Yeah. In 1948, when Israel was established, the Jewish population of Israel was about 650,000. The Jewish population in the United States was about 6 million. In other words, there were almost 10 times as many Jews in the United States and Israel. Now there's more or less a parity. Mm -hmm. The Jewish community is somewhat diminishing. And think how serious that is, because there have been enormous migrations of Jews since World War II. There were the Holocaust survivors, uh, who were were by and large, somewhat many of them were a traditional group. Something like about a million Russian Jews came to the United States. There have been yeah. large numbers of Iranian Jews, yeah. South African Jews, Israelis, the number of yeah. Israelis, and yet it means yeah. that we should be bigger in numbers than we are. Right. So that's the concern for me, and I think in this time, identifying with Israel is important, but we know that there's been somewhat of a diminution yeah. among younger Jews. I think it's through the light of Torah that's, yeah. been, our, uh, we, uh, that's been our holiest book. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Rabbi okay. Delushkin. I hope you'll uh, look online and pick up some of his wonderful books, most, most recently The Revenue. Thank you so much. Okay, good.